Welcome. We are so glad you joined us for our snowstorm edition of Native Plants at Noon. I'm Tammy Thompson, Outreach and Conference Manager for Deep Roots. And as all of you know, who've been on here before, this is one of my very favorite days of the month. And I'm so excited that you all decided to join us. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all in 2020 as we continue to unpack the benefits and beauty of native plants and the amazing creatures uh, they support. Uh, next month, um, for Native Plants at Noon, we will uh, be back at the, at the uh, Discovery Center uh, and discuss new things as we approach the spring edition of Native Plants at Noon. Today, though, Alex and Sydney are going to tap, tackle difficult gardening situations. And I think we all have at least one of these challenges that they're going to cover. Uh, big thanks to those of you who did share your challenges. We did hear you. I think some of you put them on Facebook, and we so appreciate that. During the program today, if you have questions, please note those in the Facebook comments or in the Q&A tool in Zoom. Uh, I'll be using the chat to send you plant information that they've mentioned and any links that Sydney and Alex share. So let's go ahead and get started. First, we want to express a big, big thank you to Missouri Department of Conservation for their partnership on this series and everything they do to help encourage and empower people to plant more native plants. And with that, I'd like to welcome landscape specialists Sydney Ross and Alex Daniel at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center in Kansas City. Sydney and Alex, take it away. Hello, everybody. Hi. We hope you're all doing well on this snowy, snowy day. Um, this is Alex Daniel. That's Sydney Ross. And as Tammy said, we're the Native Landscape Specialist here at the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center in Kansas City. And we have a show for you today, a lot of information about these uh, difficult gardening conditions um, that we're gonna go over. So we're gonna jump right into it. Um, and if you have any questions, please put it in the Q&A and we will try to get to all your questions. Okay. I don't know about you, Sydney, but I've been thinking about gardening a lot lately. Yesterday, it was hard not to get out there do a bunch of work. But I know. It today, really <laughs> I'm happy and ready to go through some pictures from the years. Me too. From bloom times. Yeah. So let's start with this. Photo can we here. talk about this photo? Can real we quick? please? So Alex <laughs> took this gorgeous photo. And can you tell us a little bit about like where this photo is? Oh, Discovery I can't Center? you just feel this photo. Like, yeah. can't you smell it and hear it? Yeah, I definitely. just, this would have been, let's see, early morning at the Discovery Center. Um, this is one of our biosoil beds, which are some of my favorite beds because they have such a rich diversity and so the community of plants there is always just incredible and it's always surprising me the things that happen in those bioswales they're really fun to watch they their are. work they're definitely work and we work on them um, a lot throughout the year to um, keep weedy species out. It's always going to be a fight but this i think is one of the pictures that shows um one of the like nicest uh, uh ranges of diversity and mm -hmm. um you can see we have the pale purple coneflower up front um with some lance leaf coreopsis mm -hmm. and penstemon yeah i see some penstemon there yeah too. in the background too. yeah so this is one of our um it's one of my city's going to talk about hell strip gardens and hot spots and our biosoils are definitely just one thing i love about the discovery center or about like hot spot and heat island mm -hmm. gardens is that they, they usually bloom like a week or two before um other but around the surrounding areas yeah so it can be kind of about fun. microclimates and yeah microclimates. Like that. Yeah. yeah and with that in mind it's really important to think about uh right plant right place uh when i first started using native plants in my garden designs i actually hated this phrase because i was like i don't know i was like okay yeah but what does it mean and i think that is a common thing that can be frustrating when you're getting to know uh these plants is um understanding where they thrive um, so that you can have success in your own garden. So uh, this image here shows on the left, Virginia bluebells at Bluebell Valley in Kansas City, and on the right, gray-headed coneflower out in Cole Camp, Missouri. Uh, these are two very different biomes. Uh, the left is woodland and the right is prairie. So when you're um, 
trying to pick plants for your garden, you really want to think about that. Take the time to observe your space. If you haven't been in your space for at least a year to see all um, the different seasons and kind of how um, the weather affects your landscape, that's really important to start off with. Yeah, and one one thing you can do is um, to key, to take note of what species already exist in your yard. So if you have a yard full of like violets. moss and yeah. violets, you know you have shade. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a yard full of Bermuda grass as a weedy species, then you know you've got a full sun dry situation. Right. But the great thing about native plants, and this is what we always talk about, is that these are plants that have evolved for thousands and thousands of years to be to adapt they have adapted to our weather conditions our soil conditions so it's so much easier to find plants that can work in your yard all you have to do is go to your local you know wild spaces mm -hmm. and local native plant nurseries and see what does well there and yeah and uh and just take that home definitely so okay so we're gonna jump right in the first topic is health strips and hot spots. Uh, this is another photo here at the Discovery Center in the bioswale. That might be the same bioswale. <laughs> okay, I have to admit something. So we have a lot of beautiful garden spaces at the Discovery Center, but the bioswales at the front, like towards the front entrance, are my favorite. And Alex explained a lot of reasons why there's a lot of biodiversity, but it's also gorgeous. Um, but let me go, let me step back a little bit and kind of define what a health strip is. Um, so in this case, it is a small strip of green space surrounded by concrete. Um, and we kind of mentioned microclimates. Uh, so these are just like smaller areas within a um, larger climate that are affected by things like concrete surrounding the screen space is going to make it really hot, probably going to make it dry. In this case, it is a bioswale, so it's deeper, so it does um, get flooded. Um, and it is also susceptible to things like salt and trash. Um, so in the following slide, you're going to see an asterisk next to some of the plant species, and that indicates that they are also salt tolerant. Uh, so rather than doing a whole section on salt tolerant plants, we just kind of added this in. So keep note of that as we go. Yeah, I think that like with health strips, that is one thing to think of if your health strip is concave or if it's Raised, rounded. Because yeah. some health strips, a lot of health strips in, in um, neighborhood areas are going to be where the street trees are planted mm -hmm. um, between the street and the sidewalk. Right. And those places can be really dry and shady too. True. With yeah. a um, grade like a raised them. Yeah. Bed. And then, yeah. Yeah, so then you want to make sure to watch where your water is flowing when you're thinking yeah, about these spaces. Yeah, exactly. And another thing to think about, too, um, if you're planting in a health strip that is between the sidewalk and the street, it's the pedestrian area. Uh, so you don't want to plant things that are going to be super tall. Um, you want to stick with some shorter species. Here we have some, uh, these are some great examples of plants that would work well in a health strip if it's sunny, hot, and dry. Um, these can handle that uh, ebb and flow between getting some, some wetness, but mostly stay relatively dry. Um, something else to think about too is uh, foot traffic. So if you're having people like walk through your beds and you don't really want them to, you could plant things that are like maybe some woody species um, to help deter that. Um, also, Alex, weren't you telling me there was a study about uh, native plants that are tolerant to dog pee? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So. I think that was North Creek Nurseries or something. Yeah. Yeah. They were really asking funny. people to, if they wanted to participate in a study to find out what native plants they could plant in landscaping at dog parks or like in gardens where dogs tend to urinate. So, so. yeah, if you have uh, any examples of that, please let us know of plants that <laughs> yeah. have really tolerated that yeah, kind North of Creek, traffic. <laughs> yeah, North Creek Nursery on Instagram is a really great follow. They do a lot of fun videos yes. like that. Um, so I just want to point out one thing. We're not going to go over every individual species. We don't have enough time for that today, but um, I want to just point out Rose Verbena as a great ground cover species. Um, it smells so good and it has really long lasting blooms. It's a shorter plant, so it only gets to be a few inches tall. Um, it's really fragrant in the spring, but we saw blooms on it as late as December of last year. Okay, so here is our shady um, hell strip plant combo. Um, and also um, I want to mention that Tammy is going to be linking um, uh, our references. So we did a lot of research on these uh, difficult gardening conditions, and uh, she's going to include that in the chat as we go, as well as follow up with an entire species list of all the plants we've gone over and all those references. So keep on keep a lookout for that. 
Um, okay, so I want to. I mentioned this in our last episode of um, awesome plant combos, but woodland phlox and round leaf groundsel. Mwah, chef's kiss. I love that combo together. They bloom at the same time. The colors work really well together. The phlox is slightly taller than the round leaf groundsel. But um, what I love about round leaf groundsel is it's semi evergreen ground cover. Again, you can see it's really relatively short. The only time it's slightly taller is when it blooms. Um, but those semi evergreen leaves persist throughout the year. So um, it also serves as a green mulch, which helps retain moisture um, rather than having to use um, hard like bark mulch in your space. And then we have some wet species, which would be great for a health strip as well. Um, we've got Joe pie weed, swamp milkweed, blue iris, golden Alexander. Panic switchgrass is good. It does get a little bit taller. Um, so same with Joe pie weed and, and swamp milkweed. So just kind of be mindful of that. If you are going to use. Yeah, you could put them in the deeper section. Yes, right? like exactly. Well. Exactly yeah. what I was going to say. So if um, you could either, if you have a hell strip that has that kind of like divot that holds water. You could put it in the center at the deepest point so it doesn't appear as tall. But again, if you are planting these along the sidewalk, just be mindful of that because that can become a problem. And as we all know, we're trying to have good intentions with our native gardens for PR purposes. So <laughs> native plant of PR. That's right. Okay. And I know we're going to be shifting gears quickly. We are going to get to <laughs> questions at the end, but let's go over some walnut tolerant species. Um, I was actually surprised when I did this research on how many native plants are walnut tolerant. Um, again, a great, great thing you can do is go out to your natural areas, look for walnut trees, see what's growing underneath them. But why, why can't, why can't the plants under walnuts? Oh, that's a great question. So <laughs> walnut, walnuts have this chemical called juglone. Um, I hope I said that right, Juggler. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Um, and it is a chemical that inhibits the growth of other plants. Um, so uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to use mulch made out of um, walnut bark leaves or wood chips because it carries that chemical. Um, and there are a few plants that actually struggle more with this chemical. And I've got a little list here. So uh, false blue indigo, columbine, viburnum, hackberry, silver maple. Those are all very sensitive to this chemical juggling. So that's why it's really, it's really hard to grow turf grass under walnut trees. Right. Too. Yeah. A lot of plants are sensitive to that. So, um, but these species here can actually handle it. And um, so I, I think about shrubs a lot of times too, when I'm trying to think of what I would plant under a walnut tree. And I was happy to see that smooth hydrangea and spice bush, among many others, which you can find in that. Um, link that Tammy's going to put in the chat are resistant to this chemical. Yeah, those are both. Sydney and Alex. Sydney yeah. and Alex, your screen is cutting off. Can you make full screen? Uh, some of our folks can't see the very bottom. Let's see here. So again, it wasn't letting me go to full screen earlier. Can you put that at the very top? You get at the very, very top, you get a green um, to make it full screen. And go to the very top of your top left hand. See that green button at the very top? It barely it comes down. Go to the very top of your screen, left hand side. You'll see, see that green? If you make uh, it full screen, no green at the top left. Up, it pops oh, down. Oh. Ever so quickly. Here we go. Oh, there. There. perfect. Thanks, ladies. Yeah. Sorry about that. I was looking for that option earlier. <laughs> I'm a millennial. I should know how to do this. <laughs> Thanks, ladies. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and I just froze the PowerPoint. Okay. So um, while it's loading back up, don't worry. Again, we're going to send every list of every plant. Yeah. All the links. Yes. Everything. We know included. this is a lot. <laughs> and this will be recorded so you can go back, but yeah. hopefully you can see that better now. So, um, yeah. So I think of these shrubs, um, these are really great options. And then we have some herbaceous forb species like coneflower and bee balm. Um, if you haven't checked out uh, Monarda bradburiana, this is a really uh, nice type of bee balm that tends to be shorter compared to Monarda fistulosa. Also, are those... Oh wait, no, I thought those were ants on that photo, but ants are really cool pollinators too. I got really yeah. excited for a second. And that, that bee balm can handle shade, more mm -hmm. shade than um, a lot of our other native yeah. plants. Yeah. Um, and then here's a few more. Okay, I know um, everyone is like, okay, Eastern uh, red bud, 
sure that's like a, a plant we see everywhere i love that small tree i think it's gorgeous um it's kind of the harbinger of spring for me and i love that uh walnut can tolerate it so when you're trying to plant underneath it think about your structural plants first then go for your uh kind of middle ground herbaceous flowers and things like that and finally end with some ground cover um something i want to do this year is work more with ferns um because we have a ton of awesome native ferns um, and i personally don't have a whole lot of experience with them but I did see in, in my research that there are quite a few that are tolerant to juggalon. So that's pretty cool. Nice. Okay, and now we're moving on to the next topic, deer resistance. <laughs> Look at that cute little baby. What a monster. We are so lucky here at the Discovery Center to not have to deal, deal with deer pressure. We yeah. have some rabbit pressure and these are, we're gonna talk about deer because a lot of these species are the same, um, are rabbit talk rabbit tolerant is what we'll use yeah and deer tolerant Herb, a tolerant of herbivory yes <laughs> um they can handle some herbivory if they do get nippled or they or the deer do not like them because of a strong flavor or a strong taste or a prickly texture mm -hmm. some of these are the plants that you can go with um for that so um this is the the set of uh flowers that i picked out of the long long list of deer resistant plants that are for full shade so just a few that are my favorite are wild ginger that one probably tastes bad to deer because it does taste like ginger it's very spicy mm, yeah um celandine poppy is a gorgeous addition to a spring ephemeral garden we put round leaf ransel again just because it's our favorite it's such a great plant you it's, gotta have it in your yeah yard. it's so it great so well. it's such a great shade um ground cover so there are lots of options for the list of deer resistant plants is very very lengthy and then here are some stun options that are deer resistant so this is the little combo of few different flowers that we really love here at the discovery center and do these do really well in kansas city and in, in, in the midwest um in um in garden you know in uh, domestic garden yeah domestic situation so blue blue false indigo false blue indigo the wild blue indigo the gateway whatever. gateway drug of native gateway. plants i love it yes <laughs> and i wonder why i actually don't know why deer wouldn't like that i'm well it is toxic it's toxic yeah but it does look like it would taste like a sweet pea, wouldn't it? it? Especially those <laughs> yeah, but that plant is actually toxic. So um, to so humans that and deer like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and then blue sage, that one definitely has a smell to it, a flavor to it that's really, really strong. Mm -hmm. So the deer don't go for that. Yeah. Yeah. So I also heard. So you're talking about like different textures and strong scents, like things in the mint family. Mm -hmm. um, I also I thought I read. Is it all? Is it true that sappy things like milkweeds or uh, they yeah. wouldn't like that too? Yeah. And and like what the milkweed too the sap usually tastes bad like the flavor of it and and milkweed can Gummy. make them sick too so yeah okay so then <laughs> we have clay and compacted soil now a lot of us have clay issues in our gardens and that is because um with uh erosion and degradation and the construction when houses were built on this land this land used to have uh, most of um in the kansas city area and um near where we live mostly it was tall grass prairie bottomland forest and in the tall grass prairie areas which are typically the areas that get um knocked down first for development unfortunately they um the when, when during the construction and the building of the houses you lose all that topsoil that nice topsoil so that's where how you end up with the compacted soil the clay soil that a lot of us um deal with mm -hmm. now one way to fix that very easily is to leave your leaves um when we talk about like a really heavily compacted clay well i'm gonna go sorry let me back up <laughs> let's do the sun ones first yeah the sun plants that do really well with clay now these are all tall grass prairie species that can be found locally right around here in kansas city on our um and on our uh, remnant prairies and prairie restoration so these are just some really these are these are a few taller species that offer a lot for pollinators and um a lot of color throughout throughout the summer and fall Something I read uh, that I thought was kind of interesting too is uh, someone recommended planting things that have really fibrous roots 
because as those roots like break down, it will add organic material to the soil. Yeah, for sure. That's that would be the case with like the the fox gum beard tongue. Yeah, That's really. Yeah. Um. Not. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Actually, yeah. if you could, can we go back just yeah. one second for sure. Yeah. If you think about it, like a lot of these plants don't have the big um tap roots. Tap roots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're like corms for the for the liatris, and yeah, they have more top top heavy roots. Thank you. Um, and here are some shade species that do well in clay. And that's what I what I went back to say was that um, if you have if you have a clay area in a shade if you have a shaded clay area, <laughs> really what you should be doing is leave the leaves, leave your leaves on, um, build up that organic material yeah. because you don't have anything to break down if you're just blowing all the leaves off or raking everything off every year. So try to build up that organic material however you can. And right. yeah, because if you think about it, like a dry, uh, shady clay area is not really a natural type of space. Like, well, yeah, it's not, yeah. not for this area. Not for and this not for area. The that yeah. Right here. There are right. definitely clay taught like clay specific species in a lot of other areas in the U S but right. we don't, that it's can deal shade, but yeah. here it's like, yeah, there's, we're looking for woodland species like yeah. you see here. Yeah. And so like over time, uh, hopefully you would be able to amend that clay soil mm-hmm. by adding native plants, leaving the leaves, mm-hmm. building up that organic material. And then later on, you could plant these less clay tolerant species, right. ideally. So, but these are some of the species that you can use in um, a clay heavy shade situation. Again, the wild sweet William, always a winner. Dutchman's fruit Solid. is a little bit harder to find, but I have seen it at nurseries before. That's yeah. a spring ephemeral. And then shooting star is just a gorgeous so heart shaped cool. plant that is um, a little bit bigger too and can handle that clay. Okay. So, so before oh. we take questions, I can't believe we're already we did it. at the end. <laughs> we were, we had, okay. We just thought this would take three hours. We, we, we could definitely talk for we know, hours about I know, topics, We know that was a lot. That was a lot. A lot of images. But quickly, we just want to say we have some really cool in-person programs coming up. Um, uh, so you can see that there. Um, I also am teaching intro and native landscape design next Friday. You can register through um, MDC and then join us for one of our monthly in-person native landscape chats. So. All right, yeah. I'm sure we have questions, so we would love to dive into that, and we still have time left to do Yay! it. Yay, we're so good. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys really rocked that. Thank you. <laughs> we do have some good questions. Um, first, from Val, where seeds have disappeared from my Forbes, can I trim back the stems? I have a large garden area, and I'm worrying about suddenly having to do everything all at once. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you need to cut back your plant material, um, I I don't think you'll be doing it today, but, um, (laughs) so we have, but you could, you could do it. We, we do recommend waiting until temperatures get up into the fifties. So that'd be like the end of April. But if you wanted to cut it sooner than later, um, you can cut it down and maybe bundle it and set it up against your fence or a tree. So you're still leaving the plant material. This is important because we have a lot of overwintering insects that live in the stems and um, we need these insects to continue their cycle and also provide food for things like baby birds, adult birds come spring. So, yeah, but we totally understand the urge to get out there and get to cleaning up. Yeah. Just try to be conscientious about it. And sure. we we'll also understand that not everyone gets paid to do this like <laughs> if you have a time crunch and you're worried there's we 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 also like to just you know remind people that if you have like full sun species you definitely want to get those cleaned up by the end of march yeah. because they are um and then and and any spring blooming flowers that you have you want to get those cleaned up by the end of march because there there is a chance that they can get um smothered they're not you know typically right. going to have that cover on them in in the wild if you leave up a bunch of debris yeah you know. yeah it kind of goes back to like look understanding the surroundings like prairie species are not used to having lots of, of leaves dumped yeah. on them i mean they are trees around them yes so. yeah, yeah. they question. want to be burned yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that kind of leads into our next question from susan she says then do i turn the leaves into the ground come spring Mm, We don't till, we We don't don't do it. Yeah, we never do any tilling. Um, And there's a really big reason for that. Um, Well, there's two really big reasons for that. When you till or move the soil around, um, you you are just stirring up the seed bank. And a lot of times that seed bank is full of um, 
of non-native invasive seeds. I heard something terrible like honeysuckle can lay dormant. Honeysuckle seeds can lay dormant for just an upsetting. A well, long less of time. is the same oh, it's way. Oh, the same way. Yeah, okay. it's the same way, yeah, and it's like like hundreds of years. Yeah, so if you till, like that, that's yeah. why if you kill less Bediza, then right doesn't it just pop? It just it, it yeah. Pops, so pops faster. yeah, it's better to and, not like disturb the soil. Then you're also yeah. upsetting like the bacteria that exists in there and the the mycorrhizae. Yeah, like the, the mycorrhizae is the other big issue because if you're 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 upsetting all the channels and networks that the mushroom have formed underneath the yeah. soil and and possibly killing off the good bacteria and stuff so but something you could do like if you wanted to get the leaves off that area is maybe move them to a, a different area maybe more discreet maybe put them in your compost if they're not breaking down and you'll see that yeah. happens more so like oak oak tree leaves take a lot longer to break down also if your soil isn't used to already breaking down leaves it tends to take a longer time I know yeah. it's like not the most instant gratification so we, yeah answer, and then but. another thing that we do is when we remove our leaves from our beds in the in March um, if we need to we mulch them so we will mm -hmm. run them over with a lawnmower and then move them into beds as a mulch right. on some beds that need that kind of a mulch if you cut if you chop them up and heat them up as you can then they will compost so much yeah faster. which will kill the insects in them but if you do it later like yeah, in the spring when the insects have emerged, then yeah. you're not causing as much harm. It does so. feel like there's like a very small gap of time, <laughs> and it's we hard. we realize that. So not everyone's going to be perfect about it, but the more you can think about those connections and what's actually going on in there, in your soil and your leaves and stuff, the the yeah. better it is. <laughs> nice. We have a question from Holly. This will be a quick one. What is the average yearly precipitation in your area? And do you provide supplemental irrigation after establishment if you do um, not receive rain? I have no idea. I'm going to look something I should know, but I can talk about the supplemental yeah. irrigation. Yeah, talk about that. We'll look okay. up our annual precipitation. So here. we, we don't, get more though, right? Than other places. Uh, like in Kansas City. Yeah, we, um, yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, although the Tonkinoxie split, if y'all haven't heard about that, it does it cause storms to miss us all the time. And they go to Tanny's house instead of the <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Yeah. But um, so we have, um, when we do a, an installation of a bed, if it's in the spring, we, we love planting in the spring for this reason, because a lot of times the rain will take care of it for you. But if you're planting in the fall, and it's dry and hot you want to make sure that you're watering your plants and and this is in the spring too if you're planting in the spring and it's not raining consistently you want to make sure to water your new plants um for the first i don't know i i give them like a month or so what do you think i watch them you for about usually a month. say like a, yeah a couple weeks um couple weeks and definitely the first two weeks are the most crucial when you first yeah. plant them because you want to make sure those roots get established and they um, don't go into they're way more fragile yeah. at that stage but after that I just, I always recommend um, if they're established, just kind of keep an eye on them and you'll, you'll start to notice that they're really sad and they need uh, some water. We had some serious droughts um, last, this past year um, towards the end of the year. So um, yeah, we, we had to supplement just a little bit, but not we do, we, we do water on purpose. I don't know if I would, it just keeps your plants green or blooming right. a little bit longer. And that's just an aesthetic thing. Really, the right. plants are actually going to be fine and yeah. they're just going to pop back next year. But if you want to keep your garden looking nice, go Pretty ahead, much. throw some water on it. Yeah. No, no, no one's going to blame you for that, especially yeah. if you have trees. Like that's something I always think about yeah. too is like, if you're watering your native plants because they're getting too dry, your trees need a drink anyway. So yeah, like, yeah. go yeah. ahead. I, um, um, I, I can't find the annual precipitation. I think my phone's not running, but this is, <laughs> it might be, it looks like maybe 36 ish is the historical average. Oh, nice. Um, but we get that all in six weeks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which exactly. makes the rest of the year dry. <laughs> so we have a question from Ken. Ken says, I have a huge sycamore in my backyard. I have heard the leaves are prone to mold. Is that a problem for composting? Oh man, sycamore leaves are, are, they're they so take, big. they're <laughs> so big. I love, I love we love it. my face. Yes, <laughs> we are big fans of sycamores over here. Yeah. They are, um, they, they do take a long time to break down. 
gosh. They do. And okay. you know what I just thought of? I haven't thought about this until you just asked this, but sycamores in the wild are typically found in wetter situations. And I wonder if the leaves break down more because, because, of, of the, because of how wet they are. That makes but if sense. they're in a dry yard, it probably takes a lot longer. Yeah. Our, our sycamores, we actually don't have any sycamores in beds here. We only have them in our turf grass so their leaves stay on the ground well for, for what about over while. by sycamore station there's like a hydrangea bed oh yeah you're right so that, well, but that does get... and we don't take the leaves off of it um and i uh, going back to your question about it, it would the mold hurt it it doesn't it's part of the process of it breaking down is what i would suspect. yeah there's but, yeah you're not gonna the, if it's like a consistent issue where you have plants dying of mold then maybe put them in yeah. a brush pile somewhere. And else. also maybe that means you need to reconsider what plants you have under your sycamore if they're not able to handle that amount of leaves. Um, it may not yeah. be the right place for them. Uh, but that's kind of the cool thing in general when you're, I think people ask like, how do I get started with planting native? Um, do your best, do your research, but also it's okay to move things around. Um, you, you're just gonna have to take the time to kind of see how things do um, and go from there, so. Perfect. Then we have a question from Kristen. Kristen asks, she says she has a lot of hickory trees in her backyard. Is hickory the same tolerant as, is it as hard as walnuts, for example? No, no, they don't have the same chemical. Um, as, as far as I know, I don't think they do, but. Yeah, I don't think they, the hickories have jug blown. They do they have some tannins. Yeah. yeah, but I don't, I, I don't, I haven't I, had any issues. When I think of hickories, I'm thinking about the times we've gone hiking. Mm -hmm. um, specifically last year, we were looking for pawpaws, pawpaw fruit for our educational programs. And there were a ton of hickories nearby. And I do know pawpaws are actually a tree that are tolerant of jug loan. Um, but it seemed like there were plenty of, of understory shrubs. Mm -hmm. There were plenty of herbaceous and ground cover type plants underneath it. So you should yeah. be okay. And you do. And think about, if you think about it like that too, that, um, our most high quality forests in, in the Kansas city area, Missouri, the, are oak hickory forests. Right. These are our most high diversity, um, area. So I would think that probably not much. Yeah. Under I would think so. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think we have, we're just one minute over, but let me just find one more. One more we will question. answer these questions um, and get them out to you. If we can get them turned around, we send everyone who attended an email with our resources. So if we don't get your question answered live, we will get your question answered. So um, here's a question from Leona Walton. She says, more invasive natives taking over versus right place right plant, right place. How much can you balance or reduce work versus aggressive change? Okay, so I wanna point one, the, one thing out real quick, just kind of a technicality. Native plants cannot be invasive. Um, invasive is a term reserved for non-native plants that cause environmental and economic damage. Now that's not to say there are, they're definitely aggressive native plants and there are definitely aggressive native plants that we do not recommend people to plant in their residential spaces or even larger spaces sometimes. Yeah, that's what she's talking about. They don't, you don't have to plant them. They will just show up on their own. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So like for instance, Canada goldenrod is a species that we do not, um, we do not let stay in our more formal beds. Right. We have some special spaces for it, which are like everywhere else, but <laughs> right. they, yeah. um, if you're, if you're, that's just part of weeding definitely is not letting those aggressive species come in. And big part of how you can prevent that is don't give them space. Make yeah. sure that your plantings are tight. Make sure that the, that the, the intention, the, the plants that you have are filling the space um, all up so that there's no resource for that right. golden rod to come in. Don't, bit, don't make big bare spots of soil in your garden. Mm -hmm. um, Brett Creason would hate it if I said that. He <laughs> we, loves, love you, we love you, Brett. We love you, Brett Creason. We love Brett. I just uh, find your person. He loves bare, bare soil for the bees. Which is important. Which is important too. But, <laughs> but um, not in a bed when you're trying to keep weeds out. Yeah. Don't you know, worry about it. Don't feel bad about pulling native species that are too aggressive. <laughs> they'll, they'll that's really a, that's a really quick way to lose control of your garden. Something but. else I think about too is uh, pla uh, planning is really important for that reason. And to start with your structural plant, like in this order, structural plants, uh, seasonal interests, that's like your uh, herbaceous forbs, and then do your ground cover species, the, the, the ground cover species will fill in uh, and be a little bit more aggressive, but with everything else that's established um, and placed intentionally, it should be, it should kind of come together like a nice community. Yeah. Um, and then I, this is probably a, a controversial thing, but 
I do recommend that you mulch your garden the first year, if, especially if it's, a, if it's a new planting, mulch it because that's gonna suppress those weeds. Um, if you can't plant things tight enough, because um, even if you do, they're teeny tiny plants and you're gonna have gaps yeah. in between them. We always mulch. We always mulch for at least the first two years. Right. Usually. But um, we, after that, you after don't need that. it because the plants fill in you and should, they do the work. You shouldn't need it if your design yeah. is good and you and you've chosen the right plants that right. are thriving. Perfect. Well, thank you too. I'm going to ask that you, have you stopped sharing your screen? Sure okay. have it. Thank you. We really appreciate you too. Um, yeah, we appreciate you all. Yeah, thank you. You're right. And I will share mine real quick. All right, so if you haven't been out to the Discovery Center, I really encourage you to do so. I was out there just last week and it was beautiful. It probably has a little bit more interest today with the snow, uh, but it is still teeming with textures and sounds and uh, just, it's really interesting to see the birds uh, just dance on the, on the plants that are still left up. So thank you so much that you do so much to uh, keep our wildlife entertained there. To learn uh, more about what's going on at the Discovery Center, you can go to mdc.mo.gov and search for events at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center or any of the other conservation areas that Missouri Department of Conservation uh, oversees. The Deep Roots site also has many references to native plant garden design, so hop on over there. We have uh, lots of references to soil and design and plants that tolerate uh, different different exposures. So we continue to add new content and we're updating what we have too. So there's always something new to see there. So don't miss our, our webinar event next week. Hillary Noonan, a landscape architect and founder of Mad Hatter Compost Tea, will join us to continue our conversation about soil health. You can see Hillary's first episode on soil health on the Deep Roots website under webinars and garden uh, and maintenance, this webinar picks up where the first webinar left off. So we will work extensively on practical ways to improve your soil health for native plant success. So don't miss that. And if you have missed any of our episodes, you can find them all at deeproots.org. We record and post each one. And while you're on our site, we would be so grateful if you would consider making a donation to Deep Roots as well to continue our work. So have a wonderful day, and we will see you back here on March 17th for the next one. Have a great afternoon and stay safe and warm.